to start by just acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're using today and to pay our respects to the elders present and past for uh, the land which we're using today. Um, this is a day of celebration of course for the wonderful work done by SSI but it's also a very challenging time in which we live. We've seen the atrocities committed in Paris and in Beirut and Russian holidaymakers being blown out of the sky in Egypt and students being massacred in Kenya in April this year. Terrible things that are happening in the world. 
So we're going to start slightly unusually today by asking you to join us in observing one minute silence for as much of respect just for all of the people who have been victims of that violence. <laughs> We are, of course, celebrating today the wonderful achievements of Settlement Services International. 15 years, of course, uh, it's been a big year of celebration for SBS as well. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary of promoting this wonderful experiment called multiculturalism in Australia. We're very proud of what we do, and we're very proud of the voice that we give to communities, especially ethnic minority communities. So we join hands with Settlement Services International in, on that journey together. I was in the newsroom just about an hour ago, just having a look at what the prospects are for the evening's news tonight. 6.30 SBS. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of sad things. Uh, one was the death of Jonah Lomu, the all-black star, possibly the greatest rugby player that ever graced the field. So a bit of a sad day, paying tribute to him tonight. But also just looking at the focus that is still on Paris tonight. As you know, there's been blanket coverage of the latest atrocity. Um, our focus very much still very much on the aftermath, and the, the stories that are emerging, the stories not just of the terrible things that happened, but also how people supported one another, the Muslim guard that prevented greater death at the stadium by challenging one of the uh, attackers. But in the news tonight, I noticed we've got things coming up like mosques being defaced, people being threatened with violence, political leaders elsewhere who are now refusing to take Syrian refugees, or worse still, promoting one religion over another in, in order to, to take them into um, their countries. And it's a, it's a very challenging time. It's a very sad time for all of us, I think, to try to deal with this because it's human nature to respond with anger and anxiety and consternation and a sense of fear. That, in a sense, is what all of this is all about. But I think it's also part of human nature to then find something else. I think that's the challenge that, that awaits all of us, to try and look into our hearts, to find the compassion that exists there, to find some way of working towards justice so that we, we can move forward together and find ways of promoting peace, even if that is just a gesture to somebody that's weak to say, hi, I'm your friend. We are different, it's true, but we're also the same. I think those things are very important at this time to kind of get us through what is a very difficult time. We've got several speakers uh, to speak to us today to mark this uh, occasion of the 15th anniversary of Settlement Services International. And appropriately, we're starting with the CEO who's going to speak to us about uh, the vision and the, the history of uh, SSI. Violet Rumeliotis, of course, well known to all of you here, has over 30 years experience managing uh, public sector organizations, not-for-profit organizations, and by all accounts, a very dynamic leader uh, at SSI. In the handful of years that she's been with the organization, it has expanded exponentially from a mere 70 staff uh, four years ago to 
over 500 now, which I think is a, a clear indication of the demand that exists for this kind of work and the support that is needed by people coming in, whether they come in as migrants or as uh, refugees. So I'd like you to uh, welcome, as our first speaker today, Violet Rumeliotis. Thank you very much, Anton, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my honour and privilege to welcome you to our 15th anniversary event to celebrate an important milestone in SSI's history. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which we meet, the Derrick people, who have cared for this land since time immemorial. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and commit ourselves to a future with reconciliation and renewal at its heart. So, it's wonderful to be in the company of so many friends, colleagues, partners and supporters. All of you have shared our commitment to building a society that values the diversity of its people and to building a society that promotes meaningful social and economic participation so all people can fulfil their potential as members of the community. I'd like to acknowledge um, Harkin Harmon, Chief Executive Officer at Multicultural New South Wales, Seb Ostoski, Chair of the Multicultural Council of Australia, Tim Dawson, Alliant Chief, uh, Alliant Chief Human Resources Officer, and um, also our Chair, Commander Busi, a very important person, Peter Medirino as our Honorary Executive Officer and General Wonderful Patron of SSI in many ways, our board members, as well as our member organisations who are with us today, their CEOs, their chairs and senior staff. Welcome to our partner organisations, community leaders and funding body representatives and colleagues. And I wanted to particularly acknowledge Brad Chilcott and Mohammed al Kafaj from Welcome to Australia because they've come a very long way and they're also wonderful supporters of SSI. I did want to also just mention that unfortunately Craig Lundin won't be able to join us today. He's been caught up in a public hearing. He assures me he would have preferred to be here than where he is, but I guess that that's uh, what happens. But um, Sevozovsky will be saying a few words uh, to us later as well. So, the settlement sector is unique. Once it's in your blood, you can never escape it. And many of us in here are <laughs> testament to that. If you leave for a while, it draws you back. I sound a little bit like uh, the Godfather, don't I? <laughs> so that is certainly the case for many of my colleagues who were instrumental in setting up SSI. Many are community leaders. Are they making their marks in other in different fields? Yet all passionate about social justice and working with vulnerable people in the community. The key motivations, the key principles of those who started SSI have continued to guide us since. And it's not about SSI doing it on its own. It's about community, commitment, collaboration and unity. While I was not part of the inception vision and the foundation period, my early involvement was with the leadership of a member organisation and as chair of SSI through the non-funded years, so the four years, and the tumultuous first year when we were first awarded the Humanitarian Settlement Services contract. And I feel a great sense of personal and professional pride, initially at what my colleagues had the courage to do, and later what we developed collectively further. So SSI began as a response to a significant policy shift. Since the early 80s, there's been a flourishing of ethno-specific organisations and, following that, an acknowledgement that communities should be building the capacity to help themselves. Migrant resource centres developed with a specific focus of supporting newly arrived migrants, not just refugees and asylum seekers, but people arriving under all visa types, who had a variety of issues and challenges as they settled and beyond. The MICs played a very important role in social cohesion and community relations in their local and regional areas. When SSI was born, there had been a significant shift towards the privatisation of community services that allowed bigger players to come into the sector. Small and medium organisations struggled to make an impact. The MRCs in New South Wales came together seeking a structure that would allow for centralised tendering and service provision while providing practical support to new arrivals at a local level. 
It proved to be a wise and strategic decision. SSI, then known as Migrant Resource Centre Association, would run services in collaboration with its members who would play an active role in service delivery. And Anglicare was a close collaborator with us then and still thankfully is a great partner with us and works closer with us. He was a successful model, working with vulnerable communities, recognising the diversity of all its peoples and helping, helping them not only to be connected culturally, but also economically and financially, so they could live the lives they wanted to live. SSI continues to fulfil that mission with programs and advocacy based on the principle that all people, whether a person with a disability, a person who arrived as a refugee or a skilled migrant, all people have the right to equal access to the resources the state offers its citizens. And our responsibility is to value and respect what is important to all members of the Australian community. Human dignity, acceptance of members of the, acceptance of cultural diversity, respect for others and the law, freedom of speech and religion. I believe SSI has shown leadership in this area and with its members, it has provided opportunities to support Australians to both be proud of their adopted country and to be able to love the best of the, their heritage and maintain it through subsequent generations. Many of us here today are good examples of that. We are hybrid Australians, in our own way, adapting and moulding our identities rather than a stereotype. And it works. It's a sign in collaboration with numerous partners, specialist organisations and ethno-specific and small community groups, such as Gomea Community Aid, Lebanese Communities Council, Uniting Care Burnside, Vinnies, Dubbo Neighbourhood Centre, to name a few, provides a range of services to vulnerable people and in building people's capacity. This should be celebrated. Indeed, the partnerships and collaboration of the community-based not-for-profit sector should be celebrated. And everywhere we see people doing similar things, we celebrate them too. As much as possible, we, as a society, we help build capacity in the community. We sponsor, we mentor, we resource, and we offer in-kind support. We now have the capacity and we believe it's our obligation to give back to communities. A great majority of our bottom line goes to community-based and charitable activities, such as our play groups, our Ignite Small Business Startup Initiative, and our Community Kitchen and Society Foundation. As you will see in the following in the following anniversary video, there are many visionary, strategic, and pragmatic individuals in our midst. Indeed, many of you. We all built something that was going to work and that had long-term relevance and benefit for community. And that's why I know SSI will be operating in 15, 20, 30 years, and even longer. It will be contributing to a democratic society whose citizens are protected and treated equally. A society that is just, where all members have the same basic rights, securities, opportunities, obligations, and social benefits. Thank you again for joining us today. Later, you'll be invited to share your SSI memories. And even if you don't want to share publicly, I'm sure you have memories to share in private conversation, because this is a celebration for all of us. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Violet. Uh, without further ado, let's go to that video that Violet was uh, hinting at there, which gives us a little idea of the history of the activities of SSI. In the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a change, a significant shift in federal government policy that enabled a great amount of competition and that enabled a proliferation of for-profit providers to move into the settlement sector. And that was a, 
a huge shock, I think, to, to those of us in the sector. But I believe that Migrant Resource Centres at that time and others in the similar sector responded very visionary and with a pragmatic approach. The Migrant Resource Centres themselves uh, originated from the early 80s after the Balboli report that strongly recommended that we need to respond to the needs of migrants because we had a large migrant intake and they weren't able to access services equitably. It was a really uh, exciting and challenging time uh, for a lot of us. Uh, it was the first time that we were able to think about a way of making a collective impact in the community. There was a belief in the sector that the model and the foundations of migrant resource centres, which is the values of being client driven, being locally and community based, uh, the client uh, having a voice. We had a vision to make sure that multicultural services and programs going forward were going to be able to remain competitive and relevant. So we came together as a group of migrant resource centres to ensure that we had a vehicle to actually deliver large scale services and programs. If there were people committed, if we're not people committed to the area of migrant refugee, I don't think we would have put it together. And so we thought we would, um, as a collective, form the Migrant Resource Centre Association. I think the really strong point around the way that we deliver services was the care, the compassion, the commitment and the accountability that we brought to the work. We recruited people that had a strong background in working with people who had migrated to Australia. After the refugees came, we started to grow a little bit more, being able to put in systems in place. And it was successful in providing humanitarian settlement services from the year 2000 onwards. Five years later, we lost the HSS contract. We were obviously devastated. We had changed our name to Settlement Services International, which is a big name and aspirations are huge. I remember sitting around a table and we had Pina Mugherino facilitating the discussion and it really was about the future of SSI and if there was a future for it. So those around the table said, no, we won't close SSI. We are going to move forward. We are going to have a vision and a plan and we're going to re-apply for that tender when it comes up in five years' time. What we did was create the Connect Australia Foundation. The beauty of the foundation, I think, is that it's, um, it's an opportunity for us to, to really look outside the square, to do projects that that were innovative and also support individual refugees in a manner that isn't available. I'll never forget um, the wonderful phone call to tell us that we had been successful and had been awarded the Humanitarian Settlement Services Tender. Now, that was an extraordinary feeling hearing that because it had been a combination of five years of waiting and knowing that we have an important role to play in the area of humanitarian settlement and that we were best placed to do it. The vision was to be the very robust organisation that was able to make a real impact in the community and um, I'm not sure that anybody would envisage that SSI would grow as quickly as what we have but I think that we have an agency that is able to provide a broad range of service in the community the fact that the organisation is able and has managed to develop a suite of services and a range of services, its presence, its relationship with its members means that it's, it's not only has the humanitarian settlement services, which are the remain the cornerstone of, of SSI, but uh, the fact that it can provide disability support services, it has that legal aid partnership, it now has a community housing arm development and strategy which will also complement the services of the members. It's actually able also to value add for the clients of our, of our members. SSI over the last 15 years has moved into areas that I believe many of us 
could not even have imagined that we would have moved into. It actually understands how people are living their lives and what are the issues they are living through. And it's for that reason that it's able to be able to both compete and position itself as a significant service provider to those groups. That's what this organisation has, an ability to understand the impact of culture and language on both where people live, how they live and what they actually need. Building micro communities, festivals, places they could go to where they felt comfortable and also to be able to practice and maintain their own culture. <laughs> Community Kitchen is a wonderful project to bring people together. It's also um, a great place for uh, clients to showcase their talents, um, build rapport with all the staff, and just feel just generally happy. Food actually brings a lot of people together. It's a great opportunity to interact with our clients in a kind of informal setting. Many of our staff are from non English speaking background also, so there's a lot of affinity uh, because as a migrant you, you've experienced similar things and you want to help other people to make it just a little bit easier. I came to Australia as a refugee in 2011. I was in detention centres, both in Christmas Island and um, Darwin for almost a year. I came straight to Sydney, met by SSI staff. They actually assisted me to find accommodation and to find my way. So I totally understand at different stage of you know settlement what are the needs and how can I assist them in order to get settled more easily and more smoothly. Without the support and the infrastructure and the funding of the MRCs, there is no way that SSI could have done what it did. We took care of our clients and our people and it was done in a wonderful partnership. Now I think we all realise how important it is for us to work together because as individual migrants or centers or service providers uh, you know we may not exist uh, in future if we went alone so to keep ourselves relevant i think uh, we've got the benefit of a large organization and at the same time we continue to maintain our relationship uh, at the grassroots with you know grassroots community organizations i guess for me what sets us apart is that we are delivering multicultural programs and we're multicultural organisations delivering those programs. So our member organisations are embedded in their local community. They're managed by people from diverse backgrounds. I suppose such organisations like SSI are really important to help people to achieve their goals. They just want them to be successful, but I just need someone to help me or something just to push me or inspire me. You know, and here's my question: If there is no SSI or such organisation like SSI, how would I be directed in the right path to achieve my goals? The reality in Australian politics is the advocacy of the ethnic communities is almost non-existent. We need organisations like this society who are going to be the substantial advocates of what can be done and model what is best. We would like to be able to move into the area of providing information, advice, consultancy, both locally and internationally for people that are doing similar work to ourselves that want to grow as well. Working within the values that we have, the capacity that we have, the future is what we want to make. I believe that SSI will play a very important role in continuing to assist in building strong and diverse communities in Australia. <laughs>
did you notice in one of the scenes in that uh, video, there were people from a migrant background, non-English speaking background, using giant chess pieces to play cricket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's always so inspiring to see so many powerful voices at work, and also people who are just so committed to this idea of providing support and services, because you do, Violet, do very important work. And also, I think what came through very strongly there was that attitude of never giving up, never say die. And when all else fails, food brings people together. <laughs> Don't you know that too well? well, another powerful voice that we're going to hear from now is the chair of SSI. Kamal Debussy has over three decades worth of experience in this sector, bringing together different strands of the community from government, DFAT, and Austrade, and Sydney's uh, Muslim communities. He is the uh, manager of the Liverpool Migrant Resource Centre and has been chair of Settlement Services International since 2012. And as we've heard, that is the crucial period of the development of this organisation. So will you please welcome Kamal Dabusi. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, your, your program actually notes that Pino was speaking before me, but uh, that's okay. I'll go on and Pino will ask me. We're not so necessarily stuck on that, on that fixation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Darug peoples, who have cared for this land since time and memorial. We pay our respects to their elders past and present, and commit ourselves to a future with reconciliation and renewal at its heart. Can I welcome all our guests today? Can I welcome my fellow board members, our members, our, 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 our respective chairs of our organisations as well, and others that have been mentioned earlier on in, in Wild's speech. I'm humbled to be chair and fortunate today uh, of SSI at its 15 year anniversary. I've been chair since 2012, since the organisation was 11. And I think as any parent will tell you, between the ages of 10, of 11 to 15, it's an interesting age. <laughs> there are a lot of changes to deal with. The occasional bickering, sleepless nights, but you're always proud of what has become. I think you'll agree with me though, that SSI is mature beyond its years. As Violet mentioned, that in the room today, there are many people that have helped establish and develop the organisation that, uh, that have, uh, have, uh, have rejoined the organisation, and that's a testament very much to the organisation's resonance and the work that we do. We are fortunate that they bring with them skills and a diversity of skills and experience to help us along our journey and complement the existing team at SSI. In the last four years, whilst I've been chair, our range of services has tremendously grown as Violet outlined. The result, this is a result of the MRC SSI connection and commitment to the vision. During this adolescence of SSI, and attracting a talented and capable pool of people, helping steer the organisation through a difficult and interesting time, and while it was mentioned at the first year of the, uh, of the new HSS contract, I need to acknowledge and, con and I, would, I need to acknowledge the contribution made by our CEO. Violet embodies the SSI story. She graduated not only from one MRC, but from two MRCs. <laughs> She brought those skills to make her mark and the success story that is SSI. She's an individual with values and passion and commitment at her heart and is liked by all, which I can truly say is a rare combination to have. On behalf of the organisation, while it's simply, we'd like to say thank you. I would ask you to call it. I made mention earlier of the team, and whilst it's, I, I, I should name all of them, I cannot. I'd like to acknowledge them as a collective, their capacity and ability and the ability to rise up to any challenges presented before them. I've never heard the team say we can't do something. So can I acknowledge the team as well? In particular, whilst I can't acknowledge everyone, could I acknowledge the general manager and company secretary, Peter Sografakis, whose dedication, professionalism and camaraderie I greatly come to appreciate after being shared. Thank you very much. Peter. <laughs> Picking up on the earlier sentiments, I'd like to focus a little bit on our members, our connection to communities, and how SSI has grown and diversified, and what might lie ahead. SSI's past, present, and future is without doubt linked to its membership base. The Migrant Research Centre's community roots remain at the core of the SSI's approach, 
for delivering quality, quality support for vulnerable communities. Our members and stakeholders have aligned mission and values. They understand the importance of a welcoming organisation that greets and supports refugees and asylum seekers. In 2011, when the Humanitarian Settlement Services contract was awarded to SSI, our members' dedication, dedication and commitment to their local areas allowed a rollout of a large and sophisticated decentralised service model embedded in local communities. We continue to grow in the vision that our members have. But we must always remember the reason why we're here. Our clients. We put clients at the centre with support systems and networks around them. We work, we work with their strengths, eliminating barriers and promoting self-reliance. SSI has also had a commitment to innovation. For example, the SSI foster care program, previously known as the Multicultural Foster Care Service. The focus being on the cultural matching of children to their carers, the first of its kind in New South Wales. In 2013, for the first time in Australia, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds were able to connect to accessible legal services through a collaboration between Legal Aid New South Wales and SSI. This this decentralised way of working in which the services were directly delivered through our members has had tremendous success. We continue to expand our services, such as the disability support services, specifically the ability link service, which Violet mentioned was up on the screen. We deliver a partnership with United Care Burnside and St. Vincent de Paul's, St. Vincent de Paul, which focuses on the full and active participation of people with disabilities. The community kitchen, again, folks in the video, where people come, we can provide nutrition support, meals, and provides a great meeting and social spot for our clients. We have the job active employment services, Ignite Small Business Startup, a self funded enterprise facilitation project for refugees, and our community housing service in development and growing as well. This continues to add benefit to our members and our members' clients. This continuum of services provides that instant link, that instant connection. The challenge now to develop communities and opportunities, sorry, into offerings. To do it even better in a broad range of areas, such as enhanced employment programs, social enterprise and business support, which we believe is an essential area of SSI for the future. This will provide real value for our clients, building on our clients and our community strengths. In this way, and many others, we envision that SSI will build upon our existing capacities and strengths. By developing our own fundraising arm, we will increase our ability to continue to value add beyond the requirements of a simple contract model. We aspire to be continually creative and innovative. And as a result, I'm sure you'll agree that SSI and its members make a significant and important social impact. I ask you to join us in our 15 year anniversary today. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is indeed Pina Migliorino. <laughs> I've accidentally skipped over there. Let's go a step backwards. Uh, to welcome Pina. <coughs> Pina, of course, you know very well as uh, the MD of Cultural Perspectives, a company, uh, an organization which you founded over 20 years ago. But perhaps you know him better as the head of FECA from an organization which he chaired from for four years from 2009 onwards. And anyone you care to speak to will tell you what a visionary and dynamic leader he was of that organization. He's, of course, well known as an analyst, a commentator, a researcher, and a consultant within uh, a wide range of uh, areas within this community sector, particularly within aging, within uh, dementia, and within planning for uh, organizations and individuals from a cowled back background, background. He is a great friend of ethnic minority communities. Will you please welcome Pina Villarino. I've actually asked for the lights to be put down because I was in tears during the video. <laughs> and I was really happy that I didn't get to speak next because I could collect my thoughts. I would like to acknowledge as well that we are meeting on the land of the Darren people of your nation and I pay my respects to them um, so deeply. As a migrant for this country coming here in 1964, we can only respect our first people and only by defining and respecting our first people can we ever understand ourselves as a multicultural society. So I'd like to thank you all for that. So, I've been given five minutes. Now, many of you who know me know that that's almost an impossible task. Five minutes. And the brief was, provide an overview. There wasn't any other brief. There was no 
would herd the vision, would herd the power. So this is me. And it was not just provide an overview, provide a bird's eye view. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to base around numbers. And you've seen a lot of numbers. These are my numbers. And numbers are important to me because they define. Numbers colour. If I want to actually prove a point, I'll bring out a really big statistic, a big killer fact. And they strengthen our things. This is our numbers here. And we're going to start. 71,000, 71,321,414. And now if anyone's looked at the annual report, it's going to come out this afternoon. That is the turnover for this year for SSI. Some of you will say, oh, that's that's amazing. And some of you might even question why the individual organisation gets so much, but do not judge. Do not judge. What we have done here is actually create a structure which will compete against very much the bigger charitable organisations which are lauded in our community. And unless we lord this here, we are doing ourselves an injustice. 16,000. 16,000, I actually went through those listings before and I added them. They add up to 16,000 clients assisted across the program in the last 12 months. That's a huge number. 10,000, now 10,000 is the refugee and asylum seekers uh, as individuals who've been assisted by this organisation. And this is a really big number. It's a big number when you consider that when the asylum seeker issue cropped up in Australia, SSI didn't actually say we would like to do it. The department came to SSI saying you do such a great job in refugee resettlement. Can you assist us in providing support to asylum seekers? People came to us. Organisations came to us. Funding bodies came to us. And it's really important to know. This is a big figure for me. 515. And I, wasn't, I hadn't seen the video. I should have seen it because it came up. Number of staff in the organisation. Well, as Violet has pointed out, there was a period in the history of SSI, which I'll touch on, for a good six years where there were zero staff. <laughs> so seeing 515 as a number is a wonderful thing. Because I remember at times going home, especially after we did get the grants, and trying to work out how in the heck were we going to employ people to do work to be able to make sure that we could provide services with the great dagger over our head saying, if anything goes wrong, we're stuffed. What a risk. What a risk. And I'd like to say to congratulate the government at that time for taking the risk with us. To say that now 515 staff is, is just a blessing. And you know what's so good about it? Many of those staff have been around for good times and bad times and they're there from the start. And there are so many of them are here. All right. Fifteen. Fifteen is the anniversary of today, and I think a really important one. The referencing to MRCA in that little pokey office in Asheville, and really important um, in terms of the work it was doing because it wasn't easy. There wasn't an accord between board and staff. There were real questions around it, whether MRCs could work in joined up processes without having conflicts of interest. These were tough times, and tough times which needed to be negotiated through. And that's why it's so important that my next number is 11. And this is the 11 MRCs. My friends, I know you so well. You know me so well. We've been through everything together. We have been through a time when the government said, we no longer want to fund core services out of MRCs. Fend for yourselves. And that 180,000 roughly, which was being received, which would pay for the rent, pay for a coordinate, pay for assistant, stops being core grant and had to be money that you had to find from surpluses from other projects. So you know what that means in advertising, they actually have this cumulative figure, they'll say, for every amount of money you make, you have to multiply it by 15 times, because that's the amount of advertising dollars you'd have to spend to actually make that money. You've got to consider what this is like for organisations who have core funding to turn it around and try to fund their core out of a pittance of five, 10% of other projects. The order is a tenfold. The challenge was quite expected, spectacular. Now, they have gone through that, and I would like to just acknowledge the 11 MRCs, but here's my thing, 10. At 10, I got a phone call from Astrid, sitting over there saying, we've got a few issues at MRCA, can you come in and have a look? And I was the consultant, of course I was there. I'd love being there. And as it would be known to many of you, during that time I decided to play sport and I popped my Achilles tendon. 
And I used to go around with a backpack and a purple cast and up and down those stairs in Ashfield. <laughs> and I can only tell you how hard it was. And we actually did some really interesting stuff. We redefined the organization. We restructured the organization. We prepared the organization. We renamed the organization. And then we went to that tender and we lost. We lost. And this is an important story. Why did we lose? We lost because the politics of the time had changed. We lost because the priority of the government was to actually settle people through language rather than humanity. That what they wanted was English language providers. They didn't want people who were going to deal with people as people, cultural, linguistic individuals. We lost it, but we didn't lose the fire. And that's what's so really important. Those six years were really interesting six years, but I'm not there at six yet because I've got to go to eight. Oh, eight. Yes. eight is the number of services, and this is not haphazard. Eight is the number of services because the organisation has undertaken quite specific strategic planning. It looked at two quite specific indices. If the organisation was to receive people under the Refugee and Humanitarian Programme, or HSS, it couldn't just stop there. It had to actually say, what else do we build in terms of these people's lives? How do we make them able to come into our society? to be able to be supported, to be able to be productive, to be able to participate, and to then contribute and benefit from Australian society. So it is the process of employment, it is the process of housing, it is that vertical integration. But at the same time, we are the MRCs. And as the MRCs and through SESS, we actually have an exposure to all people from diverse backgrounds. So the disability area, the out of home care services, the children's services that have developed are part of a broader continuum which actually says there is a need for these services. In the video, you heard me say that there is a lot less advocacy in ethnic communities, and that is a fact. Not only that, the removal of funding from ethno-specific organisations has almost muted them in terms of their ability to provide anything other than aged care. That fall, and therefore, the responsibilities that fall on the MRCs and organisations like SSS are, multiply, are, are much more than what they were because there is very little around. The next number is a very personal number. Six, oh, that's eight, I don't know what happened there. Six, six, where did we were going down? Years in Norton Street. So SSI was then moved from Ashford <laughs> and was brought into Norton Street. The filing cabinets went down into the garage. Um, the organisation that I worked for and that, that, that I associated with supported the, this, the activities. The board met on an ongoing basis. We banked all the money, we invested the money, we actually made money during this period because there were no costs. <laughs> it's a great way to run a business. From my point of view, I just want to acknowledge what was happening at that time. And it was very much a commitment from people, many of you here and I know, and Amanda's not here from Wollongong, and I have to actually identify her as a number one, but people like Karin and, and, and Yuriki and so many others who were actually there. We met, you know, every month, I think it was. We met often over six years and what we did is we put away this money and through the money we needed to maintain our DGR status and so what we actually did there is set up the foundation and provide scholarships to, to young African, well not African, refugee students, a number of them were African and we also be, we were able to provide money to organisations and you know the byline was, come to us when you need something that no one else is prepared to fund. <laughs> It was a beautiful thing to be able to say. Those six years were spectacular. And then what happens is something quite spectacular, and we're going to talk about it a bit later on. Four. Now, it's a little bit out of depth, chronological order. Oh, right, 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 we're going to go to four. All right, four. A little bit out of chronological order, but this is a number of venues, and the fourth one is here today, Bankstown. Uh, I've got to say, my first one was this little place in Auburn that I actually found <laughs> with a bit of a storeroom at the back which was absolutely dirty but we were desperate because the staff and cultural perspective said you know enough is enough <laughs> <laughs> to have four or five people in each individual cubicle and some of you are here and I've seen you and people say this used to be such a quiet place to work in. <laughs> And what were they doing? They were putting together packs with nappies, with sanitary packs, with, you know, everything to be able to meet the initial requirements of the program. Now we go to two. Two is a lovely number. And I'm going to go into, I'm almost finished, but all, it's, it's two aspects of this. Two is the, the contracts we receive under the HSS program for Sydney South and Sydney North. This is an organisation that had no infrastructure. This is an organisation that had vision. We got given the two biggest contract regions in Australia. And it was early January. 
I was on holidays for once. And Violet <laughs> rings me up and says, you know, um, are you okay? And I go, yeah. And she goes, we got the contract. I go, yeah, which one? <laughs> she said, both. <laughs> and then I think there was, there was a good half a minute, just silence. It was like, what the <laughs> How are we going to do it? And how we did it was quite extraordinary. And before doing that, I should have actually said those two contracts were one because of the involvement of a lot of people here, but two quite specific people. Ricky Bartels sat with our numeric consultant, the person who put the figures together and went through every single job activity that a person would need to do in a type of organisation. I think I would take up two days, two days of hour by hour. And there's another person here, Melita Schmilich, who worked with me as the absolute perfect person to bring this all together in terms of these tenders. So we actually have two examples. But I'm going to one, and I'm almost finished on one, but there's a few ones. One is a parliamentary secretary who then became assistant minister who changed the frame. Yeah. Okay? You know who she is, Kate London. Why I mention her specifically? Why I mention her specifically? All right, Kate, and then we are. Why I mentioned her specifically is that she looked at the framing of IHSS, renamed it as HSS, and actually said what we need is 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 centralised capacity and localised delivery, and we actually need to bridge the, the nexus between service and community. And there we were with a model which was unsuccessful six years earlier, which was perfect for the new ratio. The goalposts, you know, they start the goalposts and move. Guess what? We're playing a game and the goalposts were moved for us. We were able to keep the goals. We actually had the structure to deliver the services and the programs. It's absolutely brilliant. There is another one, though, and it's slightly bigger. No, that's, that's it. That's it there. And that is Violet Romeliotis. Now, the reason I'm picking you out, Violet, of course, there are so many people, but you do deserve attention. You deserve, I, I thought there's an old, uh, the, in, in software terms, they used to go, um, I was trying to remember who the pay was, they used to go, there's only one such and such and such. And so I wanted to put it to the song, which is, there's only one Romeliotis. There's only one Romeliotis. And it goes off, but I won't sing because I can't sing the peanuts. But, there needs to be a sense of while there is collective strength, there has to be individual leadership. And then Violet, the person who was actually there as a chair during those those um, you know fair years, to then take the mantle of an organisation and lead its development is is a and you know is an achievement which needs to be chronicled, it needs to be acknowledged, and it needs to be congratulated. Thank you, Violet. <laughs> And the last one, and this is for me the biggest. I talked to you a little bit about this, about my working with the MRCs. What you have, what you are, how you work. We can have disagreements, I have no issue with that. We can have conflicts, and I have no issue with that. But the collective strength of 11 organisations who are themselves in an ascendancy to work together to create an organisation which will compete against the best of the NGO sector, the charitable sector, and the business sector to provide humane, respectful services. You are the number one. Thank you. Thanks very much to Kino and Yorino there. You know, we always thought Kino didn't have any weaknesses, but now we know better, of course. <laughs> It does have a weakness, it's the Achilles heel. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you're negotiating anything with him, go straight to the Achilles <laughs> Our next speaker is a migrant from a Polish background. Of course, I'm a migrant from an African background. So a few months ago, we had actually spent an evening together and we had a really interesting conversation about the different pathways that we followed to get to where we are here in this multicultural 21st century Australia. And I think that really kind of goes to the, the, the basis of what we're all doing here today and generally about getting people in uh, to a sense of safety, of human dignity and respect. And I think this man has certainly worked tirelessly over the years to do exactly that. So Ozdowski, of course, is the chairman of the Australian Multicultural Council. We also know he's a former Human Rights Commissioner and a former Disability Discrimination Commissioner. 
not to mention his day job, which is uh, as an academic working out of Western Sydney. He's a friend of all of ours. Will you please welcome Mr. Seth? <laughs> Thank you very much, Anton, for this warm introduction. In a way, I thought today that it's my relax day. So I have not I, I came here for a party, for a very good party, 15th anniversary of SSI. But I've been asked to say a few words because they probably can't be here with you. So first, let me acknowledge our important guest, Kamel Debussy, chef of SSI, is also the CEO of SSI. We've got also Hakan Harman, uh, CEO of uh, Multicultural New South Wales. Of course, Pino, who spoke before me, old colleague from the Office of Multicultural Affairs, but also very important leader in ethnic communities. Also would like to welcome all of you who provide that magnificent leadership in ethnic communities to people from MRCs in particular but also to the sponsors and to the people who are settling here. They are very a very important part of the organization. I, of course, would like to pay my respect to Gadigal people of your own nation, first Australians who were looking after this area for a long time before we came. Some of you wonder about my accent, as Anton said, it's Polish. Small mix. I uh, I was a refugee in Germany for two years. I acquired a bit of German accent. Then, of course, I had to adjust to Australia. But I go back to 1975 when I arrived here, and I still remember six o'clock at the airport bus, very old bus, taking me to the western suburbs to Villa Reception Centre. Oh, it was a Westbridge hostel. Now it's detention centre. Times change. I remember the first decision, first when we got a little hostel apartment there. We are so good because in Germany we lived in one room and uh, in somebody's apartment uh, for almost two years. Here, finally, we had something on our own. Then there were these important uh, choices. Do I join Commonwealth Bank? Or do I join the Bank of New South Wales? <laughs> to be sure, we join both. <laughs> then, of course, English language. And I remember running into trouble with the people who were looking after the hostel because we had plenty of stickers on the walls with different English words, which were more difficult to remember. When we finally remember it, we were taken down and there was a spot for another words to come. And then, of course, first job. I was lucky in a way. My wife who was an engineer. I was social scientist, so it's not that easy when you don't have too much English with you. She was an engineer, so she got a technical job in a Ralph Simon's plywood factory in Homebush. Now it's Olympic areas. And uh, she fixed me a night shift so I could work on a press and press plywood together. So when you go to a shop, you could get it. And then slowly, slowly, I was moving on. We moved to Canberra, first to Army, by Canberra, and so on. What was important, really, during this first year, it was the help, the services we received. At that stage, it was provided by the government. At that stage, organization like yours didn't exist. But your type of organization are of extreme value to newcomers. They are not only helping them to feel at home, but they are opening doors to new opportunities. And if you do not open doors to these new opportunities early, you'll be lagging behind. And therefore, it's so important not only to put all effort into English, and especially when you are a refugee coming from a war country, thinking all your family over there, maybe the age is not the youngest, it's difficult, but still you've got to do it. Finally, I've got also five minutes on this. So allow me to say a few words about multiculturalists. And I really do believe that Australia is the best multicultural country in the world. I really do believe so sincerely that Europe doesn't compare with us. 
things. Multicultural is, is really about two things. One thing is really joining Australia. It's a commitment to your country. It's ability to learn the language, to function in this new society. But it's also about equality. It's also about fair go. It's not joining us going somewhere and sitting in suburbs where nobody wants to go. It's about joining, about being equal. It's about joining to participate in uh, political processes, and to about having a good job, and so on. It's also about joining with keeping your culture. Because if you don't carry your culture with you, if you don't treasure your roots, you can't be good Australian. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks very much, Sir. Well, our next speaker is another Australian success story, someone who came here from Turkey as a 10-year-old. He started his public sector career in the uh, uh, Community Relations uh, Commission, uh, then moved to the State Library, and then back to the Community Relations Commission, as it was then called, as CEO. He works tirelessly to build bridges between business, government, and community organizations. Today, of course, uh, that, uh, the name of that organization has changed, and he is the CEO of Multiculturalism New South Wales. Please welcome Hakan Hamid. Well, thanks, Anton. Uh, look, I can't sing, although I, my wife would probably say, give him a microphone and he'll give it his best shot. Uh, but you're almost near the end. You know, I could also maybe ask you to just stand up and just shake your hands around a little bit. I, I probably won't take five minutes, but then I probably will. Because um, I can talk. I don't know how to say um, say this, but firstly, actually, I should say I'm also representing Minister Ajaka, Minister for Multiculturalism in New South Wales. So I have to be on my best behaviour, especially since the camera's on. Um, look, it is an absolute privilege and an honour. I'm so pleased I didn't speak after the, the video. I'm so pleased I didn't speak after Pino, and I'm so pleased I actually I am actually speaking after Seb because I'm thinking, wow, how am I going to top all of this? You know, what do I what do I got to say? Um, can I also acknowledge the Darug people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders, past and present? Very important for us. Um, since coming in and taking over the CEO of Community Relations Commission, that I can talk about, a little bit about multicultural New South Wales, but I'm sure most of you know all that as well. Um, we've been go going through a fairly massive transformation of our agency, and I am really privileged to say that in working very closely with, um, with Violet and Command and the rest of the team in very different ways, and a very diverse range of ways. And just three of the things I touched on earlier as well was the Asia Cup. We had 3,000 tickets, uh, which we worked together to distribute. And just a simple thing to give 3,000 people who would not normally be able to afford tickets to go and watch the Asia Cup. I think that was just wonderful to be able to collaborate to, to achieve that. To bring Metropolis to Sydney, to work in a collaboration with the SSI leadership and also with the Australian Multicultural Foundation. Um, an outstanding achievement, I believe, for our state, for our city, and for what I believe is the leading multicultural state in the world. Um, absolutely. And, and the, the last thing I can say is just so many other collaborations we've had in terms of your participation and support for the Premier's Harmony Dinner in all that we do. Um, one event we had on Monday, I'm not sure if any of you were there, I, I think you were, that was to invite Professor Andrew Marcus to come and speak to us about the social cohesion or the Scanlon Social Cohesion Index. And this year showing that there is a consistent support right across our nation for multiculturalism as the core of who we are as a nation, as, as a people. And I think this is really important. For some reason, uh, over the weekend, we we're getting text messages and emails going backwards and forwards after seeing the tragic events in Paris. Uh, and it's really nice to see also that uh, no one's mentioned cowering violent extremism and what this terrorist scourge um, has the, the potential to do to break down our social cohesion and the community resilience that we enjoy as, as an outstanding community. Um, 
And Professor Marcus spoke about the fact that 86%, um, you know, I don't want to, you've, you've done a lot of numbers, but people still support this motion. And for some reason, given that, and I'm never going to remember this, because we were at the State Library, my, the wonderful mm -hmm. institution that I worked at, um, I actually read from a book and I quoted that it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. This tale of the two opposites and the tale of two cities, and I just thought, you know, in terms of all the, the data that I hear and people talk about, relatively speaking, the Earth is experiencing as a collective one of the most um, sort of peaceful times in its history. And what a paradox when you see lunatics running around killing innocent people and, and to see this. And then you hear from um, UNICEF that we're actually experiencing the worst humanitarian crises the world has ever seen since the end of World War II. And, and I just think, how lucky am I to be able to stand here with people from all over the world, un united in our diversity, and, and what a huge responsibility we have as Australians to ensure that we continue to stay connected, to ensure that we show leadership to the rest of the world and that's why I feel so privileged and humbled to be able to work so closely with the likes of Violet and Kamal and the rest of the team and to participate in any way that my organisation can. So on this day, I'd like to congratulate you on your birthday. Thank you very much for having me here to, uh, to, to acknowledge and um, to participate in the celebrations. I look forward to the party too, sir. So. Uh, <laughs> have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Sorry, and uh, the best of times, the worst of times. We're going to have a bit of the best of times, a bit of past. A little interlude now from <laughs> someone who is a performer, a choreographer, a teacher uh, who does Indian classical dancing in the Bharata Natyam style. She's going to give us a little performance now. Will you please welcome Karuna Gandhi? Good morning, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank SSI for having me today to showcase Indian classical dance called Bharatanatyam to all of you. Bharatanatyam is a South Indian classical dance form that uses various hand gestures and facial expressions to communicate and tell various ideas, thoughts, and stories. So today I will perform a little piece on a woman. We all go through various emotions in our life and how do we come to terms with all of them? So there's a young girl who's in love. Her lover leaves and she's distressed and she cries. But she's hopeful so she adorns herself and she awaits his arrival. <laughs> but he doesn't come and now she's disappointed and all alone. But she's a brave girl. So she goes out to find him wherever he is. She doesn't find him, and now she is deluded. Maybe he's with someone else. And she's confused. He returns, but now she's angry and says, go away. I don't need you anymore. <laughs> 
And she's a woman. So she's compassionate. <laughs> she goes back to him. But ultimately, she withdraws. She finds that her happiness is within her own self. Naika. Thank you. 
Now I'd like to invite two of the SSI clients, mm -hmm. Kusha and Chanda, who are attending one of my dance workshops at Cabramatta Community Centre, which has been funded under the Social Change Through Creativity Grant Program offered by Fairfield City Council. So this is still a work in progress. They have they're very new to dancing, to Bharatanatyam and they have only been attending for the last four or five classes. And here we are looking at, the workshop is called Our Heart, My Body, and for women of varied abilities. So what do we really feel about ourselves? Just to express through dancing, a very honest reflection about one's own self and to just freely express yourself through dance. So in the first section, they will each speak about themselves. And in the second one, what one feels about the other, a dialogue. So to start with, we wanted them to imagine to be something else, whatever they want to be in this world. So let's see what they have to tell us. Ready? <laughs> she wants to be an entrepreneur and a boss. <laughs> and she is very talkative, <laughs> like a popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies Context is everything, isn't it? How wonderful to be able to share with her the interpretation of what all of that means. I'm going to ask uh, Jamal to come back, Kamal, sorry, to come back up to um, 
present some certificates of gratitude. Thank you very much again. I know I've been seeing some of the first time around, so it depends. I, uh, I get to uh, speak again. <laughs> Isn't that great? Live. <laughs> Thankfully, don't have any qualifiers here today. <laughs> Along the path of SSI's journey uh, and success, there are, there are uh, things that we do in partnership and there are people that have contributed selflessly towards, the, uh, towards our journey and our client success as well. Uh, we're going to take the opportunity to show some thanks and gratitude to, to those people. And what I'm going to do is actually read out the names. On the wall over there are the certificates of appreciation. So we're not going to get people to stand up or, or come and grab them now. Rather, I want to acknowledge them and then towards the end of the event, we'll actually get to uh, to uh, to receive those uh, those certificates, and we'll get a photo opportunity for those that are here as well from those people that I read out also uh, towards the end of the, uh, the session. Um, just before I do go on and, and, and present those, though, uh, the video, the celebratory video that we put together, um, that was done with the assistance of uh, of a couple of people, and I'd like to acknowledge them just before I proceed with the other things. Uh, Varna, I think, is in the back row. If you want to stand up so we can say oh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> and to Stephen, who helped well, produce the video on the RBSSI as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'd also like to note Barno, I'll indulge for a moment. Barno was a graduate of the MRC Early Arts Projects many years ago, so the system works, and it's uh, by coincidence that he was a good place aside to undertake the project as well. And I think uh, Joseph has his recollection in that space as well. Okay, on to the formal part of it. SSI would like to sincerely thank the Navi Akram Centre, the Dandelion Support Network, Mission of Hope, Wrapped with Love, Saheli, I hope I pronounced that one correctly, the Embroiderers, Embroiderers Group, Women Empowering Refugee Women, Jews for Social Action, Halal Food Bank, Margaret Bailey, Balmain for Refugees, Afghan Youth, Ayana, Auburn District Cricket Club, Australian Iranian Community Organisation, Granville's, Granville Men's Shed, Holwood Rangers Soccer Club, Mazi Maz, Newington Gunners Soccer Club, Fantastic contribution and, and, and before we talk to New England Gun Club, it's a fantastic story that's been taken internationally as well. Old Knox Grammarian Association, Opal Dental, Parliament on King, Playfair Visa and Migration Services, Soroptists Sor International, the Hills District, Soroptists International, Hornsby as well. Thank you very much. If I can ask you to. And I bet you're involved if I have been any pronunciations in correct in that list. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have so many wonderful stories to tell. We've heard some of them, of course, on the video and some of the stories that have emerged in other, uh, from other directions. Whether you've come here from Turkey or Italy or South Africa, myself, Bhutan, we're all represented. We all have our stories to tell. I think we're going to take a brief respite now to take a couple of, are we going to have a couple of stories? We have a couple of stories, 30 second stories recording them. Yeah. And we're going to get, I think, members of the audience to speak to us about their 30 second of being a migrant. Who's going to? SSI story. SSI story, okay. We have the micro microphone over there. So the just the roaming microphone. If you just indicate, we have a couple of hands up there. One. Just quickly, my migration memory uh, said has gone 1965 double decker bus build hostel. Just want to share that. Very hot day, six shoeing, seven family member, Mr. Whippy ice cream. Need I say more? <laughs> On SSI, my absolute most wonderful memory, of course, is getting the contract is 11 migrant resource centres talking about not winning the contract in 2005, I believe. And there was a, an amount of money that 
they then could consider as an option. And I want to turn around because I want to try and see the faces of the MRP managers that were there then at the time. For me, the most wonderful experience in my whole career, which is 30 years, is really financially strapped migrant resource centers being given the option, take $50,000 or allow SSI to create a foundation and every single, there was no argument, there was no discussion, there was no, mm, for the first time ever, as I said, we had some robust discussion, let's be polite, there was no discussion, it was unanimous and that to me is the emblem, it is for me what the sector is all about. And the foundation was established and we launched recently, so it moves on. Well done, Migrant Resource Centre. Well done, SSR. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mark. Uh, since 2012, I joined SSI as a volunteer. And uh, during the journey that I had in SSI, one of my good memories, it was at, uh, in 2012, when I had my first client, it was a family, one woman and child, and uh, they need some support. And that day, when I support them, and when I see them at the end, that they have a smile in the face, and they're happy, that motivated me to continue my journey and in SSI and be proud of part of SSI. Thanks a lot. Hello everyone, sorry. My name is Aziz Makatsi and uh, I am a client of RSSI. Uh, I am uh, an Iraqi priest. Uh, I arrived to Australia before uh, one year and four months. And uh, I, here to, I am here today to give all the all thanks to SSI because SSI, uh, they put it, uh, my feet on the right way because of SSI, for me, SSI is my mother, okay? Uh, SSI, because of SSI, I am today, this week, I finished Certificate 4 of Community Services because of SSI, because of SSI, uh, I, I became a work placement. Uh, through SSI, I learned a lot of practical things practical things from SSI, because uh, of SSI was a good model for me. Uh, I started to be a volunteer with housing department inside SSI, because as they helped me when, when, when I was a new arrival, I want to help the new arrivals who they come into Australia. And finally, today I had uh, a job interview uh, with uh, SSI for housing position. Uh, this is my uh, uh, story of success. Thank you so much, SSI. Anybody else want to share a story? Just a quick one. Uh, first of all, when Pino was waxing lyrical about Kate Lundy, I sent her a text and told her, and she said to say thank you to everyone um, and pass on her love. So, <laughs> Kaylandi says she loves you all. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to say thank you to SSI. Welcome to Australia as the organisation uh, that I started a bit over four years ago. Um, we had no money, nothing but a Twitter account and a Facebook page of an idea that we needed a positive voice in a very ugly asylum seeker refugee debate. And uh, SSI and Wyla believed in us from the beginning and helped us uh, continue to exist to this day. And now we have our first full-time uh, staff member ever, which is our new CEO, Mohammed al and, um, Yeah, and largely that is because of the support of SSI and other friends in the sector. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brad, for all the work you do there. Anybody else want to? We have one, I think one more. Yeah. In the middle. 
Hi everyone, my name is Nabaz. I am a case manager from SSI HSS program. I started my full-time job with SSI in 2011, and especially that it was first, so June 2011. With SSI, I started to realize how the life to be in Australia, how you are helping people to change their life from the time they are arriving until they are getting better and standing on their feet. Whatever SSI is providing to those people, it's not only useful for them, it's useful for the whole community, and it's useful for the future of Australia. We like SSI. SSI is doing a great job. It's a, a, a fantastic pathway to all the new arrivals to start new life in new country. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to SSI. One more. Happy birthday, SSI. I'm here on behalf of uh, Southwest Sydney Family Referral Service. We work very closely and they collaborate with me. But of, of course, I have a long term association with Migrant Resource Centers and I, I have been witness to the ups and downs and the ugly. Um, his course around refugee and migrant, migrant settlement, like many others. And I think it is a credit to SSI, uh, Migrant Resource Centers, who had the vision to be innovative, creative, and um, to move forward, evolve, so that we can continue to provide. I notice how I say we. I don't. <laughs> Um, we can continue to provide a voice to those who are vulnerable and who can speak for themselves. I look forward to celebrating for many more years to come. Welcome you. Happy birthday. Thanks very much. It's always very inspiring to hear these success stories because, you know, we all, in one way or another, other than our indigenous friends, we're all migrants in one sense or another. And all that we really need is an opportunity to shine. So we've heard some stories there that explain exactly that. You know, I've been with SBS for a very long time. We tend to think of ourselves as the voice of modern Australia. But when I look out to you here today, I feel like you're the face of modern Australia. It's, um, we also, the other thing we always say in the newsroom is we speak of the SBS family. But when I hear the stories that we've heard today, I feel like um, this is the MRC and SSI family. Yes! <laughs> so congratulations to Kamal and Violet for the wonderful work you've done in turning around this organization and this situation to, to be the positive force that it is today. We're going to continue our celebrations outside. We invite you to uh, join us there for a couple of drinks and snacks and to continue telling us your wonderful stories. I've got to head back to the newsroom because we do have this little matter of a news bulletin to put out. <laughs> I will see you at 6.30 tonight. <laughs>